then there's um, maintaining buoyancy. So because they're trying to swim through the water um, and they're made of this really hard exoskeleton and they're not carrying a lot of water inside, they don't generally have you know, lung spaces, things like that. Most insects sink. Um, and the ones that carry bubbles underwater are too then too buoyant to really dive. So insects are always kind of battling this. Some of them have to swim actively to stay in the at the same level. And um, but some have really cool adaptations. So these two species of notonectid, notonectidae, um, they're both hemipterans. They have uh, hemoglobin. And so the hemoglobin in their bodies allows them to pick up more oxygen as they dive, replacing the oxygen um, that they carry. And so that keeps their buoyancy um, at the same level. We talked earlier about Chiboridae midges that can manipulate their tracheal sacs kind of in a similar way. They don't have hemoglobin, but they can actually expand those um, tracheal sacs and influence their buoyancy too. Another way that insects move is just by letting go and getting with the drift. So when stream dwelling insects um, release from whatever they're holding onto, they can jump into the flow and drift downstream. They can choose when to drift. So this is called behavioral drift. And they can choose to, to drift to escape predators, to move to new locations for food, or to avoid intraspecific competition. And they tend to drift more at night, maybe because they're less visible to potential predators. Um, and then sometimes there's just accidental drift or they can't control it and they get caught, swept off in a flood. This is a drift net. Um, that's shown, you, you put it in the stream, you anchor it into the stream and you leave it out for several days and you're capturing all of the insects that get caught in the drift over that course of time. Um, the problem with getting in the drift is then you sometimes you have to get back out. And so um, if you're not a very good swimmer, then it can be hard to re-establish connection with the benthos. Um, some organisms can use kind of like their legs to parachute back down. And other organisms can send out silk lines to kind of catch things or to actually accelerate their drift speed, like the simuliidae, the black flight larva. So walking and crawling on the surface and the benthos insects, some insects use a tripod gait, which means that two, two legs are moving on one side while a third leg is moving on the other side and then they switch. And that get, this gives them kind of a, a, a zigzag walking pattern. Um, the surface of the rocks and the speed of the water flow can both make it more difficult to walk. Um, but many organisms will walk upstream um, to offset their accidental downstream drift movements. And then there are some organisms that move more like caterpillars and they have suckers and kind of like a, an inchworm, they'll inch their way forward. Um, things like um, the net winged fly larvae, the fer left ferricidae. And then some organisms can actually get up and out of the water and move over land like giant water bugs and some mosquito larvae. We talked a little bit about silk in the drift, but other organisms use silk um, for movement. So this caddisfly shown in the black and white basically anchors itself um, at the end with its silk and then it pivots around that point to a new anchor point. And so it kind of moves by anchoring itself and breaking the anchor and pivoting around. Um, this works really well in very swift flows because it's, um, it's basically got a very secure connection as it moves across the surface. And that allows it to avoid getting caught in the drift. Simuleids can also kind of do the same thing where they make a little silk pad and they stick it to the rock and then they can um, stick their abdomen on one silk pad or they make another silk pad stick it to the rock and then they can grab it with their uh, mouth and then move their abdomen. So they're kind of looping from one silk pad to another. There are lots of insects that burrow in the sediments. We can see a chironomid larva burrow and how it goes down and, and comes back up. And so it has ventilation that moves its way through as it's undulating inside the burrow. And you can see some pictures of the burrows in the middle. Um, and then there are um, tipulid, Tipulidae, um, which are crane fly larvae, also burrow a lot. And then some species of um, stoneflies and mayflies, they tend to be very um, 
thin and skinny worm-like bodies. Um, and some of them have tusks and short little digging arms, making burrowing in the sediment easier. And we have surface movers. Um, you can walk, row, run, or jump on the surface. All of these tend to move at relatively high Reynolds numbers. And we have water striders that use their middle legs um, backwards to sweep backwards and row as oars, creating these um, vortices. They don't deform, they deform the surface, they don't penetrate it. And um, you can see the vortices moving behind them. They're about 96% efficient in their movements, which is amazing. They can also leap forward about 10 body lengths. And when they land, they land with their legs splayed out. So they again, don't penetrate the surface of the water. Water measurers are a little bit different and they use that tripod gait as they walk across the surface of the water. And then we have springtails, which can jump using their non-wetting ventral tube. They can jump off the surface of the water. Here's some pictures of the Jared water striders, the ones that row the water measurer in the middle, um, the one that uses a tripod gate, and then another um, little velid that I'll talk about. It does something even cooler, but um, it also can skim on the surface. Um, or can walk on the surface. Skimming is actually a little bit different. Skimming um, involves the wings. And so if you're a poor flyer, a lot of organisms will skim or sail on the surface. So they have legs down on the water, um, hydrophobic legs, and then they use their wings to catch the wind. And that would be called skimming or sailing. Um, and so they're using the, their wings for lift and forward movement. And these are just a bunch of different pictures of different types of stoneflies skimming and sailing in different ways. Um, this is another organism that can skim or sail. It's a flightless mayfly adult, and it has these really crazy bat-shaped wings. So it can't fly with these wings, but it uses them to sail. Um, and they're, they're made really strangely. They have these scales that poke straight up and we think that they um, serve as a hydrophobic, like a water-hating surface. Skating is actually like skimming on the surface, but, but hanging upside down from the surface tension. So the Dixid fly larvae and this, um, this beetle larvae can both hang from the surface, but underwater, and use that to move, um, basically, they, they skate along underneath the water because the surface of the water is moving pretty quickly. So they can anchor their gills against the surface film and then move along underwater. That's called skating. One of the, the last things I'm gonna talk about is meniscus climbing. So surface tension can create this micro topography on the surface of the water as it interacts with other objects. And so there are insects that can then use the curve of the water surface to provide propulsion um, by capillary forces up the meniscus. And so there's some really cool um, studies that talk about this. And the last one, I said I'd get back to the velid water, um, to the, uh, oh, sorry, to, yeah, to this, uh, this little water strider. I think it's maybe not the velid, but it's, it's um, similar. It can expel a surfactant, which is kind of like a soap, and that reduces the surface tension on the water and pushes them forward. So these little guys squirt search fragment backwards because their proboscis faces the rear and that generates a forward motion. Similarly, this uh, rove beetle at the bottom has two glands near the base of its tail that can release surfactant and motor it forward. So that's called marangoni propulsion. And then lastly, there's hitching a ride. So if you're really hitching a ride and it's not causing any harm, it's called a 4C, which is a form of commensalism. Otherwise, some of these might be mutualisms where both organisms are benefiting or even a parasitism. But regardless, there are organisms that attach themselves to other organisms. So a bunch of chironomids and some simuleids attach to different organisms and hitch a ride. This simuleid here you can see is attached to a heptagenean mayfly. And um, it will even go through successive molts. So as the mayfly molts off this exoskeleton, it will reattach to the newly um, emerging instar. And it will even pupate while attached to the mayfly, which is pretty crazy.
There are some marine pyronomids that attach to hawksbill turtles. And then um, we've already talked about some of the freshwater mussels whose lachidia, their little babies, attach to fi fish gills. So lots of different ways to hitch a ride and lots of different ways to move about in the water. All right, see you next time.